Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Putnam, the director here at the Concord Museum. Um, it's an honor for me to share the stage uh, this evening with Professor Louis Menand of uh, Harvard University, and who I'm sure many of you know is a staff writer at The New Yorker, the author of The Metaphysical Club, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize, and the recipient of the National Humanities Medal from President Barack Obama. Uh, we welcome everyone here in the audience, and we welcome uh, those watching virtually. Uh, and those watching virtually can uh, text or use the chat feature to send questions um, in during the program. And my colleague, Allison, will uh, be your voice here in the room. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about Professor uh, Manan's uh, new book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War. Uh, but since your last book touches more or more closely on the period of the transcendentalists here in yeah. Concord, I thought that I might actually um, start there, and let me read just from the conclusion of the Metaphysical Club, in which you write, for the next 40 years, Holmes, James, and Dewey, figures who had dominated American intellectual life for a half century, seemed to go into a total eclipse. A movement of thought that had grown out of the experience of the Civil War appeared to reach an end with the Cold War. And you ask, why did this happen? A full answer is difficult, because the Cold War changed almost everything about American intellectual life. And just one last sentence. Holmes, James, and Dewey's style had come to seem naive and a little dangerous. The reason has to do with the difference between the intellectual climate after the Civil War and the intellectual climate of the Cold War. So I, I wondered, when you wrote those words, did you know you were going to write a book about the oh. Cold War? Or, <laughs> no. uh, and, and just maybe you can comment on, the, yeah, uh, sure. on that tra intellectual yeah. transition that you talked so about. So the Metaphysical Club is about pragmatism. And it focuses on four figures, um, William James, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., Charles Peirce, and John Dewey. And the uh, first three of those were lived in Cambridge. They were uh, associated with Harvard. And uh, they knew each other as young men. Um, and Dewey was a little younger than they were. Um, and just for context, uh, for both William James and of Wendell Holmes Jr., Emerson was a major figure because he was very good friends with their fathers. And uh, he was around the house a lot. Uh, and particularly for Holmes, he was a very inspiring writer. So they do have a connection to this part of the world and to the history of intellectual life here in, in Concord. Um, so the question is, it, so the sentences that you read are in the epilogue, I think it's called, of the Metaphysical Club. and. Um, Everybody took issue <laughs> with those sentences, so I'll try to explain why. Um, so uh, Peirce was a relatively unknown figure, uh, even during his lifetime, for complicated reasons. But uh, Dewey, uh, James, and Holmes were really dominant figures in American intellectual life, really up into the 1920s and 1930s. Um, uh, not just for pragmatism, but for, for example, Brides of Religious Experience, which is William James's most popular book, for, of course, Holmes's work as a Supreme Court justice, where he served for 30 years, uh, and Dewey, in particular, for his work on education, his educational philosophy, very influential. So they're, they're these big public intellectual figures. Um, Dewey doesn't die until 1952. Um, but really, in the Cold War period, I felt that they kind of dropped off the map a little bit. So when I was in college, I was, went to college in 1969. We didn't read Dewey. I mean, I, I'd never really heard of John Dewey. We read Nietzsche you know, and Marx and Freud and people like that. Um, and when you read Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud, you think that the pragmatists, people like James and Dewey, were a little, as I said, naive. Or you could think they were a little bit naive about the motivations for human behavior. So when you read Freud, you realize our motivations are obscure to us. We don't know why we make the choices that we make. But in pragmatist philosophy, it, it, it treats choices as though they're very consciously made. Um, so in any case, I felt they sort of gone into eclipse. When the book came out, I got all these letters from people complaining that they had read John Dewey when they were in college in 1969 and so <laughs> forth. So uh, maybe I was wrong. Um, there was a feeling that the people who wrote to me felt that the liberal anti-communism that characterizes intellectual life in the 1950s, figures like Arthur Schlesinger Jr. or Lionel Trilling, were influenced by pragmatist thought. I don't think that's right, but that, that's what they thought. To me, the, the reason pragmatism fell out of favor in the Cold War was because the Cold War was about principle. And pragmatism treats principle as kind of a provisional uh, 
guesswork at what might work and what might not work. And you, some idea might work one day and not work the next day, and that's fine. But principles are supposed to be hardier than that. Um, on the logic of my book, pragmatism was a reaction against abolitionism because abolitionism was doctrinaire based on principle. And for the pragmatist, that's what gets you into wars. So in the Cold War, that, that sort of philosophy or philosophical outlook really wouldn't, wouldn't really work. So I still adhere to what I said in the book, but just so you know, lots of people don't agree <laughs> with that. Did I imagine writing this? So this book, The Free World, is about the Cold War, the first 20 years of the Cold War, 1945, 1965. Did I imagine writing that book? No, I did not. Um, am I sorry that I wrote it? Not really, but it was really a big book to write. Uh, it turned out to be much larger canvas than I imagined. Um, uh, but I, to me, the world that I describe in there is not pragmatist. Um, well, first, I want to highly recommend the book. I really savored it over the summer, um, carried it with me wherever I went. That's and nice. so many wonderful uh, biographies and characters and things that you touch upon. And I want to um, hit upon some of those, but let's just start with the overarching theme, um, why you called it the free world. And I heard you um, give an interview um, in another interview where you said you actually came to the notion of that theme of the free world yeah. somewhat late in the writing, but maybe you can kind of sure. uh, explain to us kind of what that overarching yeah. Um, message so, is. So, yeah, thank you. So as a writer, uh, I never make an outline, and I never make notes or rarely make notes about something I might want to say later on in something because I feel I get boxed in that way. And so I just start from the beginning and try to see where the material takes me. Um, and that's what I did here. I just started in 1945. We'll get a little bit into what I, who I started with and why I started there. But I started in 1945 with the end of the Second World War. And then I just sort of followed my nose a bit into the chapters. And by the time I got to chapter three or four, I could sort of see where the book was going. But before that, I wasn't really sure. So it's true that the themes or the trajectory or the shape of the book emerged as I was writing it. And one of those was this concept of the free world. Actually, I had a completely different title in mind when I started. But I began to realize two things. One is that everybody uses the language of freedom. Artists, writers, obviously politicians. It's just on everybody's lips. It's sort of the value that justifies whatever it is you're doing. If you're, if you're John Cage and making music in a certain way, it's about freedom. If you're John F. Kennedy and you're giving your inaugural address, it's all about freedom. If you're Martin Luther King and you're giving your, uh, your I Have a Dream speech, he uses the word freedom about 20 times in that speech. He uses the word equality once in that speech. That's the language of the time. So I just began to realize this is the theme. Why? Obviously, for geopolitical reasons, because we, that's the United States and liberal democracies, including UK and France, are presenting our world as the free world in which the state doesn't tell you what to think, what to write, what to paint, what kind of movies to make. You're not being censored. There's no official censorship. Of course, we had to grow out of the official censorship that we had to get to that point, but that's part of the story that the book tells. But the second thing I felt about the title was that of course, like most American historians, I tend to be very US-centric uh, and ignore what's going on in the rest of the world. But I, I very, realized very quickly that a lot of what was going on in the United States, intellectually and culturally, was influenced by what was going on in other countries, either by people who came here during the, at the time of the rise of Hitler, like Hannah Arendt, for example, uh, or, uh, or just artists and writers in France or Japan or in India or in England whose work influenced American thought. And there's a lot of transnational exchange of cultural ideas, let's say, which is one of the striking things about the period. So rather than say this is a book about American culture, it's a book about the culture of the free world, because it was a collaborative production of people from all over the place. And I tried to capture that as much as I could in the book. And there's a kind of an interesting structural conceit um, and, uh, funny because even when I was a kid I carried books like this around with me in the summer and um, when I graduated from high school my high school history teacher gave me William Manchester's The Glory and the Dream. Yeah. Now that's like a, a narrative history that follows kind of a normal sequential path but yours is kind of a Admiral. looping <laughs> <laughs> he said abnormal. <laughs> but it's a re kind of a recursive. So uh, we're going to talk about George Kennan in a minute. But more now, I'm just talking about, um, so we start at one time period, and we might hear about uh, 
foreign policy and thinking about that. And then in another chapter, we go back to that same period yeah, and yeah. see it through art or see it through music. Maybe yeah, you yeah. just describe that. Yeah. To, yeah, recursive or zigzag, I guess, is the way to describe it. I mean, uh, there are 18 chapters. And the goal, obviously, was to each chapter is like a stepping stone that gets you from 1945 to 1965. But they're not they're chronologically sequential in a vague way, but not you know, specifically. Put it a different way, I didn't want to write a survey. So survey would tell you, in more or less chronological order, sort of all the important books, all the important painters, all the important film, all the important uh, ideas and so forth from 1945 to 1965. And it would name all the writers and all the painters and so forth. And I found those books boring because you can never remember half the stuff that you're reading because it just goes by. So I wanted to take individual figures, starting with George Kennan, uh, and build chapters around them. They were like tent poles, so to speak. And then by talking about those figures and what they did, I'm able to describe the world that they did it in, the context of their, of their work. And I tried to do that with each figure and treat them all more or less separately. Because I also didn't want to make big generalizations about the period, which cultural historians tend to want to do. I didn't want to characterize it any more than roughly this idea of the free world. Of course, what I found, as you're suggesting, is that as I went along, figures who had appeared in earlier chapters suddenly pop up again. So Hannah Arendt, for example, makes a surprise visit to us during the Civil Rights Movement, where she actually weighed in on various issues having to do with integration in a weird way. Um, but she, it wasn't planned exactly. It's just there she is again. Um, and that's true of a lot of them. And that's one of the exciting things about doing cultural history. I actually learned this when I wrote The Metaphysical Club, that it's a relatively small number of people who are sort of at the center of whatever's going on. And they just keep popping up because they're interesting people and they have something to say. Um, so it was true of a lot of the characters. But it, it wasn't that I had a chart in my, not like Robert Caro has these big charts. I don't have a chart. Uh, I wish I could write like Robert Caro, but I don't have the chart. I just, as I said, I just, when, they, when, those, when I got to those sections, suddenly I need to have James Baldwin in the story again or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, this is all not repeating that topic, but you seem very biographically oriented as a historian. I mean, there yeah. must be. A, there are scores of many biographies. And talk a little bit about, yeah. uh, again, I've heard you comment on the relationship between the individual and their life circumstances and their work. Yes, yeah, so that's what you're trying to get. Um, you could think of it as a kind of uh, a graph. So one line in the graph is the personal history of the individual writer, thinker, artist, political figure. And the other is the social uh, forces the historical forces, the trends of the time, what's going on demographically, technologically, geopolitically, and so forth. And what's going on at the level of social forces is creating the conditions for the possibility of a certain kind of book, or a certain kind of music, or a certain kind of painting. And the individual artist intersects with that, so to speak. That's, and you're trying to get that point of intersection as an historian to understand how it was, for example, that Jackson Pollock was able to make the drip paintings when he made them and how those paintings became super important in the history of American art. So it has to do with the, that intersection. When you look at carefully at figures like Pollock, Elvis Presley, Warhol, people I talk about, even Baldwin, the period in which they're central to the discussion of what's going on and their work is, seems most iconic and important, it's very short. Three or four years doesn't last that long. They remain important figures. They pop up again and so forth. But there's a moment when they capture the attention of the sort of educated public, and they matter to lots of people, and they become these icons. And then they stop doing it, or somebody else comes along, or something like that. So the historian wants to capture that moment when Pollock made the drip painting, so when Hannah Arendt wrote Origins of Totalitarianism. What was going on that enabled them to do these incredible things? So. People complain that if you treat uh, artists that way, you're diminishing their kind of creative genius by insisting on contextualizing it. But they're just normal people like us. We have to make our way in historical circumstances and figure out opportunities to be able to do the things that we do. And they're just the same. They just have to be a lot smarter than us, more talented than us, but it's no different for them. And I think that's a good way of trying to explain what, what's going on and why it's important. You've touched on this earlier, but the first line of the book uh, reads, uh, this is a book about a time when the United States was actively engaged with the rest of the world. And then in the book, you talk about the shift um, 
from when the cultural center moves um, from, say, Paris to New York or in film to Hollywood. Um, and uh, it's a lot about this kind of exchange of ideas. Um, and uh, maybe I've heard you talk before about, uh, and there are things in the book that stick with you, like uh, that Sartre is reading um, you know, maybe poor translations of Hemingway, and <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe you could tell that story, and then I might have you do the same with the Beatles and the same with okay. Bonnie and Clyde. Kind of All right, you know. okay. Um, so, uh, right, so as Tom's saying, a lot of the book is about these uh, cultural exchanges, which tend to be transnational. I would say, parenthetically, that one country I wanted to write about and didn't write about is Japan, because first, because the American rebuilding of Japan is a fascinating story, Japan had been basically wiped out by firebombing and, of course, then by the nuclear bombs, atomic bombs uh, in the war. Um, uh, it was just utterly defeated, and uh, it was rebuilt. And in the 1960s, Japan had the highest growth rate in world history of 11% per annum. Can you imagine the growth of that? I mean, for, for a number of years in the 1960s. So it just boomed after the war. And during that period, a lot of that, of course, was because of the American presence because uh, we were helping to rebuild it, its economy and its political structure. Uh, and part of it was uh, because of the uh, establishment of US bases in Okinawa and other places in Japan. So it's just a big American presence in Japan. And consequently, there's a lot of American com uh, commodities over there. And Japanese avant-garde artists start working with this material much the way the pop artists would in the United States a little bit later. And they have a big influence on American art. They're very interested in John Cage and American avant-garde uh, figures like that. Um, there's a lot, a lot going on. I was not able to capture that, uh, unfortunately, in the book. But there's a lot going on elsewhere, and one of the main places um, is between France and the US. So I was a little surprised as I was writing the book in this, in this sort of you know, pin the tail on a donkey way that I have of trying to write something to find out how much French stuff there was. There are more French people in this book than I ever imagined I would end up writing about. But it's really important. Uh, and they, France maintains its centrality as a center of culture in sort of Western culture or modern culture, or really until 1959. Um, there's all this talk about how the center of art moves from Paris to New York. I think that's a little misleading about what actually happened. What happened was that when the Germans invaded France in 1940, all the surrealist and modernist painters fled because they were creating degenerate art. And they knew the Nazis would, uh, would destroy their art and they would be persecuted. So they fled. Most of them were not Jewish, uh, but they had to get out. They fled to Marseille, and they were able. Most of them were able to get to New York, um, thanks partly to Peggy Guggenheim. Um, and uh, so they settled in New York in 1940. Um, so a lot of people thought, well, uh, the German occupation is going to last forever. So all the arts will have to start making art in New York. So art will be the new art capital because nobody can make art in Paris anymore. Turned out the Germans were only there for about four years. And in 1944, after Paris is liberated, they all go back to Paris as fast as they can. Uh, so, uh, so that's an example of the way that the, there's cultural exchange by virtue of the, you know, what's going on in world politics. Um, so the example you're alluding to is that uh, has to do with Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. So they're big figures in my book because existentialism was sort of the big rage uh, in terms of intellectual fashion in the late 1940s and the 1950s, even beyond, really. But everybody read Camus. Everybody pretended they read Sartre. <laughs> you know, People read <laughs> Beauvoir. Second Sex was, was a very popular book in the United States. It came out in 1949. Uh, and very influential on the women's movement, uh, which you can talk about later. Uh, uh, so one of the interesting things about the um, about Sartre and Beauvoir is that although they were anti-American in terms of Cold War politics, mainly because they were anti-capitalist, um, they loved American popular culture. Uh, and they loved American fiction. And in the 1930s, it's a complicated story that I tell in the book. I'm not going to try to repeat it. For various reasons, there was a sort of fad of translated American, modern American fiction in France. So it began with translations of Faulkner, um, who was or neglected writer of the United States in the 1930s, was very popular in France, followed by translations of Dos Passos, uh, Hemingway, uh, all the major modernist American writers. Um, and they were very popular in French translation. The French translations, uh, if you look at them, did not exactly capture what we would think of as the particularly American qualities of these books. And they tended to turn them into French novels in a weird way. 
so it, it's odd how the French treated them, but that's what French writers read. They read the French version of Faulkner, for example, um, which, for example, didn't try to reproduce dialect. So all the characters in the French translation of Faulkner talk like, you know, Racine. I mean, it's just, it's <laughs> absurd. So, but this is what Sartre and Beauvoir read. And they got, Beauvoir read them in English because she could, but Sartre couldn't read English. So Sartre got these kind of, he got, I think, I use the word misprision. He, he misunderstood, really, what Faulkner was doing. He said, for example, famously, there's no psychology in Faulkner. What? <laughs> there's no inner life in Faulkner. What? But this suited his existentialism. So it's an influence on existentialist thinking, which is well, not about interiority at all. It's about action and projecting into the future. Um, he, he was influenced by American fiction, even though he didn't understand it. Uh, so I'm very interested in things like that. Um, how the Beatles were influenced by rock and roll, for example, um, or how the French filmmakers were influenced by Hollywood movies. So those are big stories that I try to tell in the book. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning. I wanted to do some of the cultural stuff first, but um, you start the book with George Kennan right after World War II, mm -hmm. and maybe explain why. Yeah. I assume people don't know exactly who he is. Oh, George Kennan. So George Kennan, um, I'm sure they do, but George <laughs> Kennan was the American diplomat who formulated what's known as the policy of containment which guided American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union uh, up until roughly the time of Vietnam, which is when the book ends, um, my book ends. Uh, he, was, uh, he was in the Foreign Service, and he was, in 1946, he served a second, command, second in command in the American Embassy of Moscow. He knew Russian. Uh, he loved Russia, actually. He loved Russian, he loved Tolstoy and Chekhov and so on. Um, and he, uh, was second in command to April Harriman, who was the U.S. ambassador to Moscow, to, to the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it fell to him in February of 1946 to write a telegram to the American State Department responding to an inquiry they had made about Stalin's intentions. So remember, of course, that Stalin and the Soviet Union were allies of the United States during the, uh, during the last three years of the Second World War. They were actually essential to defeating the Nazis. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, and it was unclear whether that partnership would continue into the post-war world. People in the Roosevelt administration, Roosevelt, of course, died in April 1945, but people in the Roosevelt administration sort of thought we could, we could do business with Stalin. Kennan thought you couldn't do business with Stalin. He just thought Stalin was a dictator, uh, and he would do whatever was in Russian national interest. He didn't care about the United States' interests at all, uh, which, of course, was true. Uh, so the State Department is confused in 1946, like, where are things going here? And Kennan writes this thing. It's called the Long Telegram. He dictated it from, he had a fever. He was always sick. <laughs> he would lived to be like 105 or something. Uh, he dictated it from bed, uh, and it's 6,000 words long. It's said to be the longest telegram in U.S. State Department history. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's a pretty brilliant piece of writing, even though he dictated it. And he lays out what's called the policy of containment, <clears throat> which is... Uh, that the policy of the United States should be to keep the communists in their box. Whatever goes on inside the box is their business. If they abuse human rights in the Soviet Union or in communist countries, it's not, none of it, not a, no of interest of ours. It's only interesting to us if they try to expand their influence beyond the box. Then we have to push back. So the policy of containment was to contain communism. Um, there's a crisis of that policy, obviously, looming ahead, Vietnam. Okay, so we'll get to that probably. So Cannon sends this telegram. It gets picked up by people in the Truman administration who think, alas, somebody is hard-headed about the Soviet Union. None of these, you know, sort of softball Roosevelt types who realize we can't talk Turkey with Stalin and we have to be tough. But Cannon's saying you don't have to drop the bomb on them because communism will destroy itself of its own inefficiency. You just have to be patient. So this was a policy the United States could get behind. So Cannon is called back to Washington. He's given a job in the State Department, and he writes an article called Source, The Sources of Soviet Conduct, which restates in a more formal way the policy of containment from the Long Telegram, published in Foreign Affairs in June 1947. Um, and that's taken to be, and if, because he, he signs the Article X, so it's called the X article, because he was, as a, as a government employee, he didn't want to make it seem like this was the government's position, but he was outed immediately, and so everybody thought, oh, this is the government's position. Uh, and that became the policy. So there's a lot of talk in the, uh, by administrations during the Cold War period, right through the Reagan administration, of liberation and rollback and so forth. We never did want to do any of that stuff. 
you know, when there, when there was a revolution in Hungary in 1956, we didn't do anything because we didn't want to get on the other side of the box. We wanted to stay on our side of the box. Um, so this was the policy. So I start there, and then, as I suggested, that dictates the ending of the book because Vietnam is a crisis of the containment policy. And we started intervening militarily in Vietnam in 1965 when we sent the Marines, and we started bombing the North. In 1966, Kennan is called before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he's asked, is this what the policy of containment mandated that we do? Is, is it, do we have to resist the encroachment of North Vietnam on South Vietnam? Can we just let that happen? Or, or when you wrote that article, The Sources of Soviet Conduct, this is what you were imagining we would do, is send troops. He couldn't answer the question. There's no good answer to that question. Because when North Vietnam is invading South Vietnam, you can't send Louis Armstrong over on a goodwill tour. That's not going to do it. You have to send the Marines. Once you send the Marines, you're in a completely different situation. So that's how the book ends. Um, <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to just tell, divert for a minute on one personal story. So I actually studied public policy, so I studied George Kennan. And when my wife and I were on our honeymoon, we were in this little island of North Haven and um, uh, in uh, Island of Maine. We've since learned whenever we go into a restaurant, before we sit down, we pick which chair I'm going to be least distracted at during dinner to have a nice dinner. Because on this night, we were sitting there, it was that second night of our marriage, and I realized that George Kennan was at the next okay. table. <laughs> and I couldn't do anything oh, but, yeah. you know, like, just keep kind of lead. Anyway, the, the marriage is still intact. Uh, the, the did, rest... you, did you go over? I did not. Oh we, my God! Oh, we just, yeah. I just listened in. Yeah, so, um. yeah. I did a book thing, uh, Martha's Vineyard, uh, this summer, and uh, uh, and uh, after I did my thing, this woman came up to me. She said, "I'm George Kennan's daughter." Ah. I said, "You must be 200 years old." I mean, it's not possible. <laughs> but there, she looked great. So, uh, yeah. um, so that's a, somewhat of a segue. Yeah. I mean, that we don't really have time to talk about the Truman Doctrine, and but the, to me, it's this interest. I mean. It's a time of anti-colonialism, and both sides think the other accuses the other side of being imperialist Correct. and say we're not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but maybe go from there. In the book, you bring up George Orwell, and then, or I mean, you somewhat moved from there to Orwell and uh, Hannah Arendt. And I thought, if you want to just say a word or two about about decolonization, yeah, yeah. So the big story in this period is decolonization, not the Cold War. Uh, it changes the world, it changes the globe, it changes the international map. Um, in 1939. That year is the height of European imperialism. That's the year the European nations dominated 40% of the Earth's surface. Um, and, uh, and then the war destroys that because those nations can no longer afford to have an empire. That's what happens to Britain. They just can't afford it. Um, and the French can't afford it. Uh, the French got into two major decolonizing wars, of course, into China and Algeria. So decolonization is, is the big global story. So, I talk about it in several contexts because it's, it's always going on, and it's very, it's very interesting. That it's another example of the way Americans tend to be very US-centric is we don't think of the civil rights movement in the context of decolonization, but obviously everybody else did. because That's what it looked like to them. Um, we think of it as a very kind of uniquely American thing, but it's part of this thing that's going on globally. Um, so that's very important, and it, has, touches, it touches on a lot of things that I talk about in the book. One, of course, is James Baldwin who's living in Paris from 1948 to 1957, nine years, which is the period when the French are fighting in Indochina and then start fighting in Algeria. So all intellectuals in Paris are debating decolonization. Uh, so Baldwin is pretty to all those conversations because he's living there. When he comes back here in 1957 and becomes part of the civil rights movement, he brings that history with him and those issues with him. So that's important. Another thing that's important is the rise of cultural anthropology. So I have a whole chapter on structural anthropology that nobody wants to talk about, but it's my favorite <laughs> chapter. Um, and the leading figure there is also French. His name is Claude Lévi-Strauss. Uh, he was uh, came to the United States as an exile during the war, and then goes back to France and develops the theory called cultural, structural anthropology, the main point of which is that human differences are cultural. They're not biological. So for a long time, race theory, particularly in the 19th century, a lot of this is in the metaphysical club, was based on physical anthropology, where people like measure skull size and stuff like that to decide which races were inferior. Uh, and when Levi Strauss comes along, he's saying that stuff, he's not the first person to say it, but he's saying that stuff is, doesn't, doesn't explain anything. 
what explains the reasons people are different is because they have different cultures and they develop cultures semi-independently of one another. Um, and that's, that's a big message to be giving to uh, social science in a period of decolonization. Um, so, so those are some of the contexts in which it matters. Um, I'm not the only um, writer whose scholar has written about the influence that decolonization had on the civil rights movement. The point being that the United States government felt more pressure to respond to the demands of civil rights leaders because of the fact of decolonization, because the United States wanted to be on the right side of that issue globally, or we would lose the allegiance of these new, uh, these new non-white states. This may get too deep into the weeds, but I really found that. You can't ever get too weeds. <laughs> uh, so there's the whole negritude movement, and then there's this um, conference of writers in yeah. Paris and Baldwin, and, yeah. um, and and this notion of you know where's the future? Is it in Africa? Or is it as an expatriate in Europe? Is yeah. it back in the United States? But I thought I'd read this quote of, of Baldwin's because it's a moment when he realizes. Maybe I'll just read your words. Baldwin believed. Um, in this war of ideas, black Americans had a special role. The American Negro, he wrote, is possibly the only man of color who can speak of the West with real authority, whose experience, painful as it is, also proves the vitality of the so transgressed Western ideals. That is because black Americans, unlike colonial Africans, have had experience, however warped and stunted, of freedom. In the end, Baldwin agreed with Wright, Richard Wright. The values that non-white people needed were right there in front of them. They were the values of Western civilization. All the non-white world had to do was own them. Africa was not the answer. Soon after the Congress ended, Baldwin decided it was time to end his exile and return to the United yeah. States. So it's 1956. It's called the First Congress of Negro Writers and Artists, and it's in Paris. <clears throat> and the Congress is organized by former French colonial subjects, like Aimé Césaire. Uh, Leopold Sangar and so forth, who came from places like Se Senegal and Mozambique, which were, had been French colonies. And uh, they, the, co the purpose of the Congress, which brought people from Africa and from the Caribbean uh, and other places to Paris, uh, of black leaders, uh, was, to, was to explore the idea of pan-Africanism. So for, particularly for the African uh, blacks who were at the conference, they believed that they were solidarity with American blacks by virtue of pan-Africanism, that American black culture was descend, was just part of the diaspora of African culture, and that there, there was a kind of commonality or common bond that they had by virtue of blackness. Um, some people looked at it as a kind of racial thing, you know, that black people are just different, so all black people share these characteristics which make them different from white people. And some of them thought of it as just a historical commonality, which had to do with the fact that black people everywhere were oppressed by white people, whether they were in America or in West Africa. So, um, so Baldwin goes to this conference, and so does Richard Wright. Richard Wright, who's also living in Paris, who exiled himself to Paris, uh, goes to the conference. Richard Wright is participating in the conference, and Baldwin's there as a reporter. He writes an article about it. Um, and Baldwin and Wright's view is that pan-Africanism Africanism is wrong, because basically African culture is backwards. And the way for blacks in Africa and elsewhere to truly liberate themselves is to adopt Western values. That's not what a lot of people at the conference want to hear for obvious reasons. So that's, a, that's an interesting moment when the black Americans disidentify with the uh, decolonizing blacks at the conference. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Simone de Beauvoir. We haven't talked about too much about women. Maybe yeah. I'll just toss you. I mean, which woman of the many that you write about would you like to <laughs> share yeah. a word about? So, yeah, Simone de Beauvoir um, wrote The Second Sex. Uh, actually, so she had a relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre, as you probably know, which was basically an open marriage kind of. They weren't married, but they had what they called a pact. Um, so, <clears throat> and this was what this was well known about them that they uh, could, they were kind of. A, they had a permanent bond, but they could have affairs. Um, and since their deaths, there's been a huge amount of literature in France about all the people they had affairs with and how shitty the whole thing was. But anyway, <laughs> it was pretty creepy. But, uh, but um, <clears throat> there was one moment when Sartre fell in love with somebody else, a woman in New York, and a French woman. And I think and, and Beauvoir was worried that she would lose him. 
and then she responded, as they always did in their relationships, by having a copycat affair with Nelson Algren, the American novelist. Um, so during this moment of kind of crisis in their relationship, they, they both got over it and got back sort of to the pact. Um, she wrote The Second Sex. She wrote it very fast, as to two huge volumes, um, but she wrote it in about a year and a half. And um, the book is basically a, kind of the template for Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique, um, which came out in 1963. So it was published in France, I think, in 1948 and 1949, the two volumes. Um, and then it's translated. There's a kind of a bad American translation. It's published here, maybe 52 or 3. And it gets very good reviews, uh, and it's a bestseller for like five or six weeks. Um, so it, it had a big impact here in the early 50s. And one of the people who read it was Betty Friedan. Um, and then when she started writing The Feminine Mystique, she read it again and took notes on it. And I happened to look at all her notes, because they're at Harvard in the Schlesinger Library, and they have all Freddie Perdant's papers, and they're all her notes on Simone de Beauvoir. She read the whole book very carefully, and she actually got the idea of the feminine mystique from Beauvoir. Um, it's in her notes. So that was a big influence on, on her. The Perdant story itself is fascinating, because um, she wrote that book in 1963. And in 1963, I give the figures in the book, and I can't remember them, but women were virtually absent from American public life. There were, virtu there were no women federal judges. There were virtually no women in Congress. There were no women ambassadors. Um, uh, in the world of universities, it was, the faculties were dominated by men. Over 90% of physicians were men. Over 90% of lawyers were men. 80% of college faculty were men. Uh, women had separate colleges. I mean, you know a lot of this story. And then, of course, during that period of the baby boom, women tended to have third and fourth children which was also unusual, and to get married much earlier and not to have careers and so forth. So for Dan had grown up before the war, she went to Smith College, and she had a career. She was a magazine writer, um, and she felt she got a great education because at Smith they took, they took college seriously. Then she goes back and visits Smith during her reunion, 10th reunion or 15th reunion, and she talks to these Smith College students, contemporary college students who were there when she goes back, and all they talk about is the men they're dating. They have no interest in, in their academic work. They have a rule in the dormitories, never talk about school when you're in the dormitory. And, uh, and they take easy courses so they can get away for the weekend and go see their men they're dating. Um, and she's appalled by this. So she writes the feminine mystique for them. She's saying, this generation of women, not her generation, this generation of women is trapped in this mystique in which they think they're going to get fulfillment just by marrying a guy who's going to be successful. And they'll wake up one day and realize they're not prepared for life when the children leave home or they get divorced or whatever happens to them because they didn't they didn't really weren't really educated. And so that's the audience for her book. And then clearly the world is waiting for this because it's just like a bomb. It goes off and then the women's movement takes off uh, for the next you know ten years or so. And she for Dan remains a central figure uh, in that movement. Uh, I have two more topics and then I hope questions from all of you. Uh, uh, so I really enjoyed the chapter on Bonnie and Clyde and Pauline Kale. And since you write for the New Yorker, um, and uh, so uh, it was interesting. I was reading it last night. You know, in 1967, the New Yorker was the most successful magazine in America. It carried the highest number of pages of advertising. It would turn down uh, three quarters of a million dollars of ads for Sears Roebuck, uh, whose products were considered beneath the taste level of its audience. It's true. Um, <laughs> And then the purpose of the editorial content was to pick out a demographic for the advertisers. But then you write about New Yorker readers, of which I consider myself one. I know this was at a different time, but uh, quote, New Yorker readers, though proud of their education and taste, were culturally insecure. They did not need to be told who Proust or Freud or Stravinsky were, but they were glad at the same time not to be expected to know anything terribly specific about them. <laughs> They were intelligent people who were extremely wary of being outbrowed. Yeah. Anyway, I read that last night, and um, it's how I felt getting on the stage with you, actually. <laughs> well, in that, uh, I'm, again, these are people that I know something about, but I don't, I mean, I learned so much more from your book. Thank so that's you, meant yeah. as a compliment. Um, Thank you, yeah. And, uh, but anyway, tell us a little bit more about Pauline Kael. It's just a fun part of the, um, yeah. of the story. So the New Yorker audience, if you, if you remember Old Dishes in New Yorker, if you're of that, that age, uh, they were huge. I mean, and they're full of advertising. That's you know, that's basically what it was—a huge book of advertising with a little bit of editorial content. And but the editorial content, as I suggest, was designed. And I know that when I started writing for the New Yorker, it was still sort of the old New Yorker, it was 1990. But um, 
it was, they were very careful to have nothing that was knowing. So they didn't assume the reader knew anything. And that's sort of the trick for writing for magazines like that. Because your reader, I write for The New Yorker now, the, still, the, your reader is a very well-educated person usually. They read a magazine like that. But they're probably doing something else with their brains than you know, reading a lot of books uh, or studying. So you need to write about the subject that you know a lot about in a way that doesn't make them feel stupid. That's really important. The important thing about writing is make your reader feel smart. It's just really important. <laughs> it's true. Um, the reader goes like, oh, yeah, I kind of knew that about Freud, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, no, it's, but I, as, a reader to, I, as a reader about things I don't know, I feel like I don't know much about science. When I read a science book and I feel like, oh, yeah, I kind of knew that. I, it makes me feel good. So anyway, New Yorker was very good at this. Um, but as a consequence, uh, it shied away from anything philosophical or theoretical or you know, abstract that might be difficult uh, or challenging to, to its readership. It was very high quality writing, of course, uh, but it was not academic. Um, so when Pauli Kael comes on the scene, which is in 1967, um, and she's by then, I think, 44 years old. She's written for lots of magazines and gotten fired from all of them because she was a very cantankerous person. Um, uh, when she comes on the scene, I'm suggesting, in the, what I suggest in the book is that there's an insecurity about cinema and that educated Americans think there's something wrong with liking Hollywood movies and that I should really understand what's called the grammar of film or sort of how to talk about cinema as an art form in order to really appreciate it. The kind of movie I should be enjoying, even though I'm not enjoying it, is Hiroshima Mon Amour, movies like that, which are very hard to sit through, but sort of you feel duty bound to like that and not to like, you know, American film. So she comes along and she says, a, Hiroshima and Moore is really boring, so you don't have to like it. And B, so what if Hollywood movies are fun? Movies are fun. They're funny. Actors are sexy. There's a lot going, you know, they're exciting. Enjoy it. Relax. Don't get all worked up about having some intellectual armature to appreciate it. And people got that message. Uh, that was an important moment in sort of American intellectual life when the intellectuals realized, hey, the Beatles are great. You know, you know Hollywood movies are great. Uh, television is okay, is okay you know. Um, and she's one of the people, Susan Sontag is another one, same time, who come along and say, relax, just enjoy it. Um, so, so I think she's really important. And so of course she does it in that magazine because that's exactly what the readers of that magazine needed to be relieved of, the insecurity that they had about the way they appreciated art. Um, the, in that chapter, um, there's a, a phrase from the French film journal Cahiers de Cinéma, uh, the furious springtime of world cinema. And I thought of that kind of notion of furious springtime as almost being descriptive of this whole period that you're yeah. writing about. And uh, before I was here for 20 years, I was at the Kennedy Library, a colleague uh, was here. So I spent 20 years at the Kennedy presidency, uh, you know, living, reliving that, and the, that notion of springtime uh -huh. uh, is often you know, evoked, this moment of innocence, um, yeah. uh, which of course, ends furiously in tragedy uh, with his assassination, but then more for our country in the tragedy of Vietnam. Yeah. So I want to end there, but quote from the um, final chapter of the book in which you write that Vietnam not only shattered the image of America's invincibility, it meant that a whole generation grew up looking on the United States as an imperialist, militarist, and racist power. The political capital of the nation accumulated by leading the alliance against fascism in the Second World War and helping rebuild Japan and Western Europe, it burned through in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Just talk about Vietnam yeah. as the yeah. culminating moment. So that's the, that's the trajectory the book finally tells, which is both, the, so the tragic side of it is that we did burn through this political capital that we had. In 1945, 1950, people thought of the American government as a benevolent power. We were very generous with foreign aid. Um, we had a lot of treaties, military treaties with uh, other countries. Um, and, uh, but they thought of the United States as not a particularly important place culturally, sort of on the periphery of world culture. People like jazz, people like American movies, but generally it's not thought of as a source of civilization. 1965, that's all reversed. So 1965, suddenly the United States reveals itself as kind of militaristic, uh, kind of neo-colonial power in Vietnam, or that's the way people read it around the world. But on the other hand, it's moved to the center of world culture, which is where it is today. So it's not that we create the culture for the world, but it all flows through Los Angeles and New York uh, and Silicon Valley. Uh, social media, streaming, music, all that stuff comes through uh, 
uh, comes through the United States. And so that's, that's the story the book ends up telling, is what, we, what happened to us in terms of our political reputation, what happened to us in terms of our role that we play in global culture. Uh, so I open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Why no chapter on religious thought? Yeah, so there are many chapters that are missing from this book. And one important one is religious thought. And there's two things I might have done with that. One is that an important figure for liberal anti-communists was Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, and so if you're talking about the intellectual history of this period, he's obviously a key figure. He was very close to George Kennan, interestingly. Um, Kennan invited him to Washington to talk about policy. Uh, but he was also influential on people like Schlesinger and so on. So that's one thing. I think if I were to write the, the chapter on religion, though, um, he, so Niebuhr could fit in other places in the book. I think I would write it on the, what's called the honest to God debate. So this is in Britain. Um, and it has to do basically with how people understand the idea of God. Uh, the key figure here is Paul Tillich. Um, uh, and there's sort of a revival of Christian existentialism as a way of dealing with those questions. Um, uh, so I found that when I was actually in high school, I got very interested in that. So I found that an interesting debate. It's connected a little bit with existentialism, because partly because of the tradition of Christian existentialism. And there's a huge interest in Kierkegaard in this period. All Kierkegaard's work is translated into English. Um, um, but partly because existentialism is an atheistic philosophy. So this is a kind of answer to that. So it definitely could be a chapter on that. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Bob. Yeah. One of the things I really like about your beginning with Kenyon is the irony that you set up. Kenyon doesn't think that the American way of life is so superior. No. Dom's Dom's democracy. And, yeah. You know, you're in sort of pre- Russian Revolution, right. Russia. Yeah. And so here's the beginning to a book about, about a Cold War, which American politicians will say, it's really about our having a superior way of life. Yeah. And it's midwife by a guy who didn't believe it. It's that. true, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, you're completely right that Kennan, he, he loved Russian, he loved pre-revolutionary Russian culture. He wanted to write a book on Chekhov. Uh, and, uh, and he didn't think much of the United States. He thought it was a materialist country, immature. He thought democracies, democracies are bad for foreign policy because politicians are constantly having to you know, make appeals to the, to the public, and the public has kind of a lowest common denominator approach to things. And he actually likes sort of benign authoritarian regimes, like in Portugal and in Austria. Uh, so he's a very odd figure to be the guy who sort of saved the United States in the Cold War. But that's the only place. So, yeah, and so yeah. what I wondered is yeah. just the way you, you ended there. So, Vietnam exposes yeah. the myth and exposes us as imperialist militarism. So, then how at the end of the Cold War in 1989 through 1992 or three, do we end up with American politicians saying, oh, liberalism won, America is proven yeah. to be. Way of yeah. Well, Cannon came, so in 1989, of course, is the Velvet Revolution, uh, the toppling of the Berlin Wall. Then the Soviet Union basically votes itself out of existence in 1991. Um, in 1989, Cannon is called back before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which, to which he, had, which he had testified in 1966, as I mentioned. He gets a standing ovation because they thought this was the profit of the ending of the Cold War. Because he had predicted that communism would destroy itself, uh, and which, which it did. So then we wanted to take credit for it, too. But Kennan's view was we shouldn't take credit for it. It was going to happen. We just had to be patient. Other question? Or Alison, any from the um, virtual audience? We have a question here. Yeah. We'll do this one, and then we'll do a virtual audience. Okay. I have a, a personal question. I, I was in Yale in the 50s. Yeah. And uh, I was fascinated by your comments on the yeah. Uh, particularly that uh, little text, uh, not so little, uh, understanding yeah. poetry. Yeah. Uh, I have horrible memories of oh, no. studying 
These days, oh my God, it doesn't have a center anymore. Uh, so the Yale News Department it was the leading department for, I would say, about 30 years, uh, beginning in the late 40s. And the first school of critics that dominated the department were called the New Critics. And the textbook that was used is this book called Understanding Poetry, which is this big anthology with a lot of commentary about individual poems. And as you probably know, the new criticism is, is what we call close reading, in which the focus is on understanding the poem as a verbal artifact, more or less independent of the life of the poet or the historical circumstances in which it was written. So you're really looking at the poem just on words on the page. Um, it's obviously, some of that information is introduced to students, but mainly you're trying to teach them how to understand poetry. Some people, like Shelman here, and I have to admit myself, found that very boring, but uh, I'm thinking about poetry, but that's, that's how it was taught. So I think the first edition of Understanding Poetry is 1939. It's by Clanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren. And then the big edition, I think, was in the 40s. And then I think there were editions up well into the 1960s. So the book lasted quite a while, as a, used as a textbook. Um, so, so that was the... So that was, that was the dominant school at Yale in the 50s. And then, um, and then there was sort of a segue to structuralism in the early 60s, mainly the influence of this Canadian critic named Northrop Frye. And then uh, in 1966, Derrida comes to America and changes everything. And then Yale becomes the center for deconstruction uh, through this guy, Paul DeMond, who I talk about in the book. Uh, he's an interesting character. So, so Yale really was a dominant school. Uh, even when I was in graduate school, Yale was the place. Um, uh, you know, now I don't think there is a dominant school, and there's no dominant school of criticism. There's no kind of one way to do it or dominant way to do it. it this field's gotten very sort of diffuse, uh, which is good and bad. It's bad because I think that English, and we're getting off the subject a little bit, but I think English departments have become more marginal to the university as a whole than they were back in the 70s and 60s. Um, it's good in the sense that uh, people are free to do things that interest them. There's not a lot of pushback about that. Uh, Allison, I think from the virtual audience. Yeah, wow. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> so a really important figure for Sartre and Derrida both is Martin Heidegger. And uh, as you may know, when Hannah Arendt <clears throat> was a student, she went to Marburg, which is where Heidegger was teaching. This is before he wrote his big book called Being, Being in Time. This is the 1920s. Um, and became his lover. And they had an affair... <clears throat> that lasted, I don't know, two or three years. Um, and then she went to another university, and, they, and, he, and he decided to call off the affair. But she remained very attached to Heidegger, because she thought he was a great philosopher. And um, of course, Heidegger, in 1933, joins the Nazi party. He becomes part of the, what Germans call the coordination between Nazi parties and institutions, so the university kind of becomes Nazified. He's part of that. He, uh, he, re he dissociates himself from his own teacher, Edmund Husserl, who was Jewish. Just a lot of bad stuff. Uh, Hannah Arendt, meanwhile, has to flee Europe. She comes to the United States. But when the war is over, um, she gets back in touch with him, and then she ultimately sees him again much later on. And she remained loyal to him. So to answer that part of the questioner's question, I still don't understand it. Uh, the way she explained it was that this is just the way philosophers are. They make political <laughs> mistakes. For example, Plato. So Plato got involved with some dictator in the Mediterranean world and spent a lot of time trying to tell the dictator how to set up his country. And that was just something philosophers are not good at. They should stay away from politics. So Heidegger was also a simpleton about politics. He got fooled into thinking Nazism was some kind of, had some kind of philosophical importance. And then he realized his mistake. What she didn't know, of course, was that A, Heidegger lied a lot about his feelings about Jews and about Nazism, B, that he never renounced his Nazi past, C, that during the sec time of the Second World War, he kept a notebook called the Black Notebook in which he recorded all kinds of pro-Nazi stuff. So he never, he never gave it up. So it's, 
Fascinating that he has an influence on both Hannah Arendt, who's totally anti-Nazi, and Derrida also, who's anti-Stalitarian. Um, so that's an interesting uh, problem. There was another, oh, Ezra Pound. Um, so Ezra Pound, uh, uh, of course, was an American poet who became an expatriate in 1908, I think. He goes to Europe, and he stays in Europe for the rest of his life. He eventually ends up in Italy, and he becomes a big fan of Mussolini, and then he gives radio broadcasts during the war against the Americans, pro and Mussolini broadcasts. And he's arrested for treason in 1945 when the United States Army invades Italy, uh, and he's put in a prison camp in Pisa, and then he's taken to the United States to be put on trial. And because I think the American government didn't want to be in a position of executing a poet, uh, they decided he was uh, insane or unfit to stand trial, and he went into a mental hospital, St. Elizabeth's in Washington, where he spent, I think, 12 years. Uh, but he remained influential, and I have a list in the book of all the American poets who went to St. Elizabeth's to visit Pound while he was incarcerated, just like every major American poet went there. Um, and his books kept coming out, New Directions Press kept publishing his books and so on. So he sort of had a second career you know, as an insane person um, in the United States. So that's also very hard to explain, except you know, on the same principle that great poets don't make good politicians. But to me, that's not completely adequate. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, one. Okay. Oh, you just have one. Yeah. Any, any other questions from the audience? So I have uh, one. I mean, your um, this is kind of just a curious one. Your book made me look at things differently, and um, uh, when you spoke with uh, A.O. Scott at the New York Public Library, they had um, uh, kind of a narrator or a voice of God. Um, Describe the cover of the book for people who are sight impaired, oh, yeah, right. and and she and she said, you know, the cover of the book is a picture of the Statue of Liberty, surrounded on one side by kind of a dense fog, yeah. and the other side by kind of. A, yeah. And it, 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 I again carried the book around with me all summer. I hadn't really quite. And then anyway, you want to comment on the. That was the idea. That's why uh -huh. we picked that image. Yeah, because there's a dark side of the Cold War, which we've only touched on here, but obviously McCarthyism, anti-communism, witch hunts. Suppression of political speech, uh, uh, HUAC investigations of Hollywood and places like that, CIA involvement in internal politics of other countries, culminating in Vietnam. So that whole dark side is part of this part of the same picture, um, and I try to capture both sides of it. Um, but I think that what what we can miss if we focus on the dark side, which a lot of history does, understandably and appropriately, is we can miss the incredible amount of creativity that's happening in this period, and the very exciting art and ideas that got created. Uh, so the book is for sale, and uh, Professor Renan is willing to sign your copies. Don is here to sell them. Uh, I thought I might end with the two, ep two of the three epigraphs. Um, uh, the first is from Zora Neale uh, Hurston. Uh, Many a man thinks he's making something when he's only changing things around. Yeah. And lastly, from Tom Hayden, uh, we are free to the extent that we know what we are about. A few books that I've read of late have helped me better understand what we are about. And Professor Louis Menon, we thank you so much for being thank here you. with us this evening. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. So I guess maybe mask up for the book signing, if you want to. Oh, sure. Yeah. OK. For your sake. Allison, may I take this off? Thank you all very much for coming. Come again next week. That was great.